Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, it's, it's good to see a great turnout here. Uh, inshallah, the reason is not because you thought they were free burgers, but you actually came for the topic, I hope, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, I just want to thank the uh, Dawah and Outreach Committee, mashallah, Brother Jamal, all the volunteers. Uh, this takes a lot of work to actually set up a program like this, especially when there's a lot of food involved uh, and some good, better advertising, a uh, little extra than we normally do. So inshallah, may Allah reward each and every single one of them. And if you see one of the volunteers, just, you know, just thank them and just encourage them, you know, to, to keep on doing it because just, just let them know that this, this helps our masjid and you really appreciate what they're doing and try to be like them inshallah one day you can volunteer for even one program and it, it helps a lot inshallah so so without further ado let's get started bismillah rahman rahim alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ba'd so let's start the history of islam in america first of all why do we care about this right why should we care about this the first reason why we should care is because most Americans have been taught a myth. And that myth is that Columbus discovered America. And that Muslims primarily arrived around 1965 and after. So they're newcomers to this country. Now how many of you, uh, is anyone, did anyone here arrive in America before 1965? Anybody? There's not a single person. Do you know personally anyone who's a Muslim that arrived prior to 1965? Okay, so you have some people that are not African American or white. Still no, some. Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. All right. So most people don't, but quite we got quite a few in the audience. So this is important. We need to deconstruct these two myths that exist. Now let's take a look. This is something which most people learn. So this is a textbook called American History, a Survey. This is the 1987 edition. It's been somewhat updated a little bit, but just read what this says. This book is one of the most common AP U.S. History textbooks. Who took AP U.S. History in class? A few of you, AP U.S. History? Okay, me too. So that's one textbook that's being taught. The second place that this book is being taught is in universities around the country. This is the fourth most popular textbook in universities across America. Now just look at what it says. It says in the beginning, for thousands of centuries, the continents we know as the Americas stood empty of mankind and its works. The story of this new world is the story of a creation of a civilization where none existed. There was no civilization that existed according to this textbook. This was just like an empty and uninhabited land, maybe a few savage people roaming around, and somehow you know, Columbus came and, and discovered everything. The problem with that is that it's false, and that there's a lot of evidence that it's false. So there have been civilizations living in America, flourishing in these Americas, north and south, for over 10,000 years. People have lived in America, they have settled in the Americas, both people who we think are native and people who came from different places, not only Muslims, but many different generations, many different communities, and they built great civilizations, and they left behind lots of ruins of the civilizations that they built. So the problem is, this idea that Colum Columbus discovered America is still taught quite widely. Because we're in California, we're a little bit more liberal of a community, Textbooks are changing quite a bit, and they're saying a little bit different narrative about Columbus, but then the Muslim narrative is not very strong in there. So the problem is that from European eyes, Columbus discovered America, because you can't discover a country that's actually inhabited by people. If you walk into someone's home and you break down the door, and you kill everyone, and then you say, I discovered this house. You can't say you discovered the house. You can say you conquered and dominated the house. But you can't say you discovered it. So the reality is, in 1492, Columbus was discovered. Okay, that's what really happened. It's the other way around, right? And it's important to understand that because if you look at a world map, you know, we have to understand history, okay? The Columbus is sailing from here. This is Europe over here. And he's sailing over here to the Americas. Now what's going on is he sails this way, and when he gets here, 
he thinks he's going to India and he thinks he landed in India over here. Okay? It doesn't take a very intelligent person to figure out that India is all the way on the other side over here. So he's very, very far. He's completely lost. He's on the other side of the earth. Right? So and that's why he called the people Indians, because he thought that he had arrived in India. So that's it's pretty uh it's pretty problematic that we're being taught this narrative on a regular basis. So it's important number one for us to know the truth. And that's what we want to learn as Muslims and just as people. That's the number one reason why we care about this history. The number two reason why we care about this history is because many people are born in the United States and they identify first as Americans. You can identify simultaneously, like Dr. Tariq Ramadan, may Allah liberate him. As he says, you can be 100% American and 100% Egyptian at the same time. Some people want to do that, that's fine. Other people, they say, look, I'm actually more American than I am Egyptian. I'm more American than I am Pakistani. I'm more American than I am uh, Syrian or whatever it may be, right? So what's happening is that those people who grew up in this country, those Muslims who grew up in this country, they are pressured to give so much priority to the culture in which they come from that they feel that there's this discomfort of being identified internally as an American, even though you speak English as your first language, you dream in English, most of the people you associate with are Americans, maybe you don't even speak another language besides English, maybe you don't speak another language besides English, but somehow the culture is given more precedence than the religion of Islam, and that's problematic. And sometimes people get criticized for being too American. Right? You've heard that, right? You become too Americanized. Something's wrong with you. You know, what's going on with you? You can say you have bad character or bad akhlaq. That's not about being Americanized. Many people in different parts of the world have bad character. It's not a characteristic of being an American. So it's important for people that they feel confident in their American identity. Whether that's a 100%, 100% identity or it's an American first, parents are from the back home country identity. However you want to identify that. So that's reason number two. Reason number three we want to study this is that it has to do with your self-image. Since September 11th, if you're Muslim, people have probably at least come up to you or maybe come up to your friend or something like that and says, hey, where are you from? And this is not the where are you from because I'm from there. Cool, we both speak Arabic or we both speak Urdu. This is the where are you from. Like, you're not really American. They're trying to rob you of your I American identity and saying that you don't actually belong here. And that's a problem. And how do you respond to that? How does that make you feel internally? Because people are saying that you are the Johnny-come-latelys. Right? The Johnny-come-lately, basically, according to the definition is somebody who starts a job or starts an activity later than other people, right? And then they use the experience and the knowledge of others, the privilege of others, to obtain some kind of advantage over them. So basically when people are saying, you know, well, where did you come from? No, 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 where did your parents come from? And they want to know your back background. What they're trying to do is they're trying to rob you of the fact that you are an American as well. And they want to say that, you know what, we are American, you're not, and therefore we are entitled to certain privileges, and you're not. And that's why it's important to know this history, because it's not the reality. Muslims were here, they were here before Columbus, they were here with Columbus, they were here after Columbus, and they've been here every single generation. So we're going to see that, and also there's a hypocrisy involved, and there's a racism involved, because when an Irish American or an Italian American comes to America, they migrate to America after World War I, or after World War II, a German American migrates to America after World War II, and then somehow their, their children, they grow up speaking without a German accent, they are looked at as being 100% American because of their white European background. But if someone has a different complexion, they're gonna say, where are you from? They don't ask people, where are you from? Are you from Germany? Are you from Ireland? Are you from which other country you're from? If you don't look that particular race, you know, that particular shade. So that's important to know as well. And lastly, we want to know this 
so we can understand and contextualize the present situation in which we're in. Why is Islam in America today the way it is? How much time have we had to develop institutions? How much resources have we had? And what are obstacles that got in the way of developing Muslim institutions, strong Islamic institutions? So we're going to see that inshallah. So to give you an overview, okay, we're going to start with pre-Columbus. We're going to look at pre-independence of America. We're going to look at post-independence of America. And then we're going to look at what I call the modern period, okay, which is like 1880s and afterwards. Okay? So let's start with pre-Columbus. Okay? We have at least three documented Muslim voyages from Andalusia to the Americas. Okay? Andalusia or Andalusia is Andalus. This is Spain. And Muslims had controlled Spain for over 800 years. So they developed science. There was a golden civilization which existed at that time. And it's, it's, you know, it's important to know a little bit of the history. I'm going to give you like super summarized nutshell because we don't have that much time to cover everything. This is literally just a few you know, aspects of uh, history of Islam in America because it's a very vast topic. Okay? So Muslims were in Andalusia. They had their golden age. They had universities. They had amazing scientists. They had geographers. So what's happening is we have at least in the documents that we've found, you have to understand something. Most of these documents, most of the books that were produced, they were wiped out completely. They were burned. All the books were burned. So we're talking about the remnants of the books that we have with us. We have a documentation of at least three voyages. One of them is by a scholar by the name of Abu Hassan Ali Al Masoudi. It's a very famous scholar. He's well known. He died in the year 957. Understand, Columbus is 1492. Okay, so just so you have a good understanding of the time frame here, right? As we were, many of us were taught in school, 1492. Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? That's what we were taught, right? So now we're talking 1492, we're talking about 957, okay? 957, over 500 years prior to that. Mas'udi is writing in his book, Muruj al Zahab, The Meadows of Gold. And he basically documents a voyage of a Muslim by the name of Khashkash ibn Sa'id ibn Aswad. So this guy basically went and traveled over the Atlantic Ocean. Again, looking back at the map right here, I know we don't study too much geography in America anymore. So here, looking back over here, this is Spain, okay? This is where Muslims were, this is where all the you know, intellectual development was, a lot of voyages and everything, science, mathematics, all that golden civilization happened. Muslims dominate this entire region over here. So what's going on over here, this is the Atlantic Ocean. I'm sorry if I'm being too elementary, but I know some people, they need to brush up on their geography, okay? This is Pacific over here. You know, when you go to the beach in California, we're actually in the Pacific Ocean. Just want to remind you about that, all right? Here is the Atlantic Ocean, and this is how you get from Europe to America or any part of these Americas. You got to cross the Atlantic Ocean, and it's a, it's a long journey, okay? Especially without modern technology, and it's not, a, it's not a, uh, the safest journey if you don't know exactly where the currents are. So what's happening here is we got a documentation in this book prior to 957 where Mas'udi is saying that we got Khashkash ibn Sa'id ibn Aswad, who's a sailor. He's going and he traveled past the Atlantic Ocean. He discovered a previously unknown land in the year 889, 889 CE. And then he came back and he returned with a shipload of treasures and he came back to the region. So he writes specifically, he says, in the ocean of fogs, which is the Atlantic Ocean, that's well known, that's what he's referring to. He says, there are many curiosities which we have mentioned in detail in our other book, Akhbar al-Zaman. On the basis of what we saw there, adventurers who penetrated it on the risk of their life, some returning back safely, others perishing in the attempt. So what he's saying is, people have been crossing the Atlantic Ocean from Muslim Spain. Some of them die along the way, some of them have went and they actually came back. And he says there was a certain inhabitant of the city of Cordoba, okay, Cordoba, he, it, which was in Spain. He says his name was Khashkash by name. He assembled a group of young men, young men, his co-citizens, and he went on a voyage on this ocean. He traveled along and after a long time he went, he returned back with a bunch of gold and valuables. And then he said every Spanish, every Spaniard knows this history. 
Meaning like this is so well documented, we don't even need to go in detail because every Muslim in Spain at the time Al Mas'udi is writing, because everybody knows this. Everyone knows the details about it, so we don't need to go into it. What happens of course, thousand years later, we don't know the story very well. So now you're like, oh, I wish you would have given us more details. But he's like, there's no need to mention it. Everybody knows this, except he didn't think that you know, our history would be completely wiped away. So he didn't write more details. So that's one journey. Documented evidence, that's there. Second evidence, there was a scholar by the name of Ibn Farooq. He, he mentioned that in 999, he landed in the Caribbean and he actually came back. We won't go into that in detail, but the, the third documented evidence that we have is Al-Idrisi. Al Al okay? Muhammad Al-Idrisi is a very famous Muslim scholar as well. He died in the year 1165. So he was living in Sicily. And what happened was later on in Muslim Spain, there was some turbulence, there was some wars going on. So he decided, you know what, I'm going to go and work in Sicily right now under a Christian king and do my research and science because there's some problem going on during his time. So he was working there and he's Muslim. And in the year 1154, he produces this map. And this map was the most accurate map of the entire world in pre-modern times. No one has rivaled his map anywhere in any civilization in terms of its accuracy uh, during its time or even two centuries later. It took them at least 200 years to get to where Al-Idrisi was actually writing. So he was an inspiration for Christopher Columbus, for Vasco da Gama, for all of these people to develop their maps. There's something interesting about his map though, by the way. What is one thing you notice that's something is strange about it? Outside of you know, Africa being long and all that. Look at the top of it. See the top, the text is upside down. That's because this map, I'm showing the map to you upside down. So for Idrisi, Africa was on the top. And South, and South and Europe and Asia, it's on the bottom. Their map was flipped. And I know it w you would like find it weird and confusing, so I flipped it for you and I made it upside down for you. His actual map was the other way around. That's the way people used to view the world. We're so used to viewing the world as North America being North and up on the top and South America being down on the bottom. It's actually flipped. Muslims looked at it on a flipped way because on what basis do you say it should be like this or like this? It's the same thing. You know, how do you know it should be this way or that way? There's no, it just depends on your angle on which you're viewing it, right? So this is the way they used to view things. So anyways, he writes that, that he writes about the details. He says there were eight Muslims who sailed from Lisbon. Anyone know where Lisbon is? Portugal, okay? Lisbon, Portugal, which is right over here, corner of Spain. It's part, it's part of the uh, Iberian Peninsula, which is the greater part of Spain. And he said there are eight Muslims sailed from Lisbon. They went westward for 31 days. They arrived on an unknown island and they were captured by the natives of that place for three days. They were captured for three days. Okay. And what happened? After three days, a translator arrived who could translate Arabic for them so they can actually understand what's being said. The translator translated the Arabic, arranged for their release, and finally they said, you know what, okay, we're gonna let you go, we're gonna send you back home. And what happened after that? They continued to journey to the same region, and they had contact between these two groups. Now here's the interesting thing. What is an Arabic translator doing in the Americas? How do you get, you know how long it takes to learn Arabic? If you've ever taken an Arabic class, you probably dropped out. That's what happens to a lot of people. <laughs> you know, they don't make it. They're like, I want to learn Quran. <laughs> Arabic class, Arabic 101. <laughs> That's it. By week five, you're out. Right? So that happens to a lot of people. A fully conversant Arabic speaker translating for them. They went and found one and they brought him over. What does that mean? That means that contact between these two regions has been sustained for a very long period of time such that there are people living there who know the Arabic language. And this is all documented. These are books you can go and find them and you can read them. Okay? So that, those are the three voyages that we know about specifically documented from Andalusia or Andalus which is Muslim Spain. Then we go and we move on to the Mandinka voyages. Okay, so the Mandinka are a specific group of people from Africa 
They're from the west side of Africa. Today is like modern day Mali and some of the surrounding areas. These, you know, you have to understand something. I'll give you a little bit more background because when we think of Africa, we're like, oh, Africa, there must be a bunch of jungles and there's a tiger and there's a lion there or something like that. Africa, you have to understand, let me explain something to you. Africa, their golden age of this area, they had a civilization. The Mandinka civilization was one of the greatest civilizations that was produced, that ever lived. They had, in a city known as Timbuktu, they had three major Islamic universities. One of them was known as the Sankor Madrasa or Sankore Madrasa. This is a very prominent Islamic institution where scholars would come from all around the world to study. To put it this way, during its time in the 14th century and a little bit before that, they were golden age of their civilization. The only library that could have rivaled the library in Timbuktu was the Library of Alexandria, but it had already gone down in prominence. So this was one of the largest libraries in the entire world sitting in Africa. As people don't think, oh, library, Africa, you go there, you do some research, there's all these books. We're talking about the largest library in the world at the time. So it's very important that you understand that. So these are the people known as the Mandinka. They're an advanced civilization. They have astronomy, they have mathematics, they have science, everything is being taught over there. You know, so now, unfortunately, you know, it's gone down and there was some issues with, you know, terrorism and all that. But, so we're losing some of the manuscripts too. But the amount of knowledge that's there, the amount of remnants, the amount of manuscripts that's there, it's very important. So what happens is that there is a scholar by the name of Shahab al-Din al-Umari. Okay, he died in the year 1349. Now, he's not from the Mandinka. This is an Arab scholar. Okay, he's from like greater Syria or something. He goes... And he is in Egypt at the time. And Egypt is also a center of learning. There's a great civilization. What happens is there is the leader of the Mandinka in Africa at this time. His name is Mansa Musa. Okay? Mansa means like Khalifa or like the king or the Khan, you know, like the great leader basically. So Mansa Musa, this is supposedly this guy in the picture here. It looks kind of cool. It's got a cool background. So I just chose this picture. All right. So Mansa Musa was pretty much the richest guy that ever lived in the world, ever. And I want you to understand this. This is, there's, you can't even calculate his wealth because there's a lot of gold in the Mali region. So they mined so much gold, and this was such a powerful civilization. He was the head of the civilization at the time. So Mansa Musa decides to go for Hajj because he's a Muslim. Hajj is a long ways away. From West Africa, you're going to travel all the way. So the Mansa Musa decides, you know what? We're going to take a bunch of people. We're going to make a giant caravan. And we're going to load up a lot of gold on our camels. And we're going to spend the gold along the way while we're moving through the Muslim lands. It's going to be able to help everyone. Because he's got so much gold. He's got so much gold. Nobody else has this much gold. So he decides, he starts going, and he starts spending all, and everyone writes about Mansa Musa. Every city he goes through, there's so many people, camel loads is full of gold, and he's just spending, and he's giving and helping people and everything. So when he goes and performs his hajj, he's on his way back, and he's coming into Egypt, and Shahab al-Din al-Umari meets him, and he starts to talk to him. And he says, you know, we, we want to know what's going on, right? So he, he I, you know, I want to know a little bit about your history. I'm a historian. I would like to document something. So he interviews him. So keep in mind, when Mansa Musa was in Egypt, just he was traveling back from Hajj through Egypt, Shihab al-Din Umari, he wrote that he spent so much gold in Egypt that the value of gold decreased for 10 years after Mansa Musa passed through Egypt. I mean, 10 years, because the more you have one product spreading, the demand, you know, supply and demand, right? Simple economics. So now the value has, you know, gone down. So it took 10 years for the value to recover. That's how much gold he spent. So he's, he's interviewing him. And basically what he says is, for the sake of time, I'm going to summarize it. He says, my elder brother, he says, like, how did you come into power? He said, my elder brother, his name was Abu Bakari. Abu Bakr, basically. Abu Bakari. Basically. My elder brother was supposed to be the king. He was the king. He was the Mansa of the time. And what happened was, is that he told some people to sail across the Atlantic, and he wanted to go and explore towards the west. 
And again, the West Africa, it's a little bit south of Spain. They can easily go through the currents that are coming on the Atlantic Ocean heading towards the Americas. So he said, I wanted, I wanted someone to sail over there. I sent an expedition. One of them came back, reported in, and he said, I want to go and I want to see this thing for myself. So he goes, his brother, who is the Mansa, who is the head of the Mandinka civilization at the golden age of their time, he says he went and he took one expedition, second expedition, they came in two expeditions, you combine the number of ships, 2400 ships across the Atlantic. Okay, Think about that, Columbus is sailing with three. Okay? So 2400 ships, this is huge, this is massive. So he goes and he sails across. But he said, but he never came back. He never returned. And we don't know what happened to him. And I'm going to tell you a little bit later what probably happened to him. But he never came back. So he said, as soon as my brother was gone, I was next in line to become the king. I became the Mansa. Man, I'm the Mansa Musa now, richest guy in the world. Okay, so we're going to talk about his brother in a little bit. So what's happening here is we have another documentation of a voyage coming from this specific region where the Mandinka people are around Mali region. They're sailing across and they're getting to westward land. and They're discovering some civilization over there. Okay, so there's that. Now what happens later on is, we, again, we've lost a lot of the records. But what we do have is we have some other documentation, some other evidence that's appearing. So we have inscriptions. So if you go through Brazil, Peru, we have inscriptions from the 14th century in exactly Mandinka ideograms. Ideograms are the symbols that they use to write. It's their language, basically. So these ideograms, they were they're writing a story, they're preserved, and when you date them, they're exactly from the same time that the person, that the Abu Bakari was actually sailing and all the other people were sailing. Meaning that there is very strong evidence for contact between the Mandinka people and the people in the Americas, because they left behind these traces that are now being discovered and being studied and being found. And how are you going to get somehow a coincidence that the native people of Brazil or the native people of Peru or whatever other you know, country it was, how could they somehow have the exact same language as the people who are in Mali? Just all of a sudden they just, you know, it's such an awesome language that people just thought about it and they're like, this is how we should draw this exact word. It's not likely to happen. So there's evidence number one. Number two, you have a Native American tribe in South America that uses the same Mandinka ideograms as their form of written communication. How can that be? That can only happen if there was actually contact between these two worlds and they're going and learning this language. The third piece of evidence is you have another tribe in North America. They're using many words that are similar to the Mandinka language. And the fourth thing is, you actually have a Central American tribe that has clan names like the word Mandinka. They are called the Mandinga or Mandinka. So how does all of that happen? Right? It only happens if there's sustained contact between the two civilizations. So that's a little bit about pre-Columbus. There's more. There's some documentation of Chinese Muslims arriving in America. There's other documentation. I'm not going to go into all the details because it takes too long. Let's move on to pre-independence. Okay. So when did America acquire its independence? You shouldn't be doing fireworks if you don't know this date. 1776, right? So pre-independence, prior to that, let's talk about that region. So you got... All right, so you got um, Columbus sailing in 1492. So in 1492, what's happening? There's two things happening. One is Columbus is sailing... But the second thing that's happening, we don't want to stare at this guy too long, all right, until I get to him. All right, so <laughs> people are like, who's this guy? Well, we'll get to it, inshallah. All right, so pre-independence, 1492, Columbus is sailing the ocean blue. It's true, that's when he sailed. But there's something else happening in 1492. So Columbus was actually going and petitioning the leaders of Spain says, I need, you to meet, I need you to finance this expedition. We need to go sail across, and we need to find a route to, to where? Where is he going? India. India. So we need to get to India, and we need to get around. Why are, they go, why are they trying to go around and get to India through the other route? Because they used to go from the east. Because it was easy to travel because you have Constantinople, and you have the remnants of the Byzantine Empire. 
But something happened in 1453. Who took over Constantinople? The Muslims, the Ottomans. They took over, the Ottoman Empire took over Constantinople and it turned into Istanbul. Istanbul, right? Got renamed later on. So Istanbul or Istanbul is now shut off to these Western Christian Europeans who wanted to get to India and you know, kind of get into the spice trade and everything else in India, get all the goods and everything. So they're like, we need to go find another route. So Columbus goes and Columbus is studying a bunch of maps and everyone else like Columbus, they're studying all of these maps. And which kind of maps are they studying? Studying Idrisi's maps, they're studying Muslim maps and they're looking at Muslim navigational techniques. They're, they've taken the Muslim technology because they're conquering Spain now. It's called, what's called the Reconquista. And what happens is that Columbus has been going around asking, hey, you know, can someone finance this expedition? You know, can you go and give us some money? And they didn't have, they didn't want to give him the extra money. Because they said, right now we're at war. We're, we're, we're trying to finish off these Muslims in Spain. So Muslim city after city in Spain has been falling. Muslims have been losing all of their cities. The last city to fall in Spain was Granada. What year did it fall? 1492. And when a city falls, and it's just, I mean, there's a decade-long war against Granada. In 1492, Granada is taken over. Once you take over the city, you take over everything in it. You get all the gold reserves. You get all the other wealth. This is the last major Muslim city in the entire area of Spain. So Muslim in, Muslims in Spain are finished now in terms of political power in 1492. Now we got money from the Muslims. So they took that money, said, okay, Columbus, you can go. Use former Muslim money to finance the voyage of Columbus to go to the West. So one, Muslim money. Two, Muslim navigational techniques and Muslim maps. Three, Muslim technology of science and navigation that they've been building up all of this time. So they're using all of that. And on top of that, Columbus goes, and he's got one of the people navigating his ship is Pedro Alonso Nino. He's actually navigating one of the ships. And he's a Muslim. He's a Moor. And what a Moor is, is a Muslim. So M-O-O-R is a derogatory term for a Muslim. It doesn't matter where you're from. You could be from Africa, North Africa. You could be an Arab. You could be a convert Spaniard, but you converted to Islam. You are called a Moor. Right? So he was one of the guys, Pedro Alonso Nino, who was actually guiding one of Columbus ships in the first voyage in 1492. So there was a Muslim on Columbus's ship. And what scholars say about Moor, it's, it's interesting. They see the term Moors has no real ethnological value. It's, there's no, it doesn't achieve anything. It's just a derogatory term. Okay? So he is sailing on there. Then you got Rodrigo de Triana, another guy who's on Columbus's ship. Right? He was the first guy to sight land. So if you look at this, Columbus in sight of land. This is a postage stamp of one cent, you know. It's, the price has obviously changed now. So this is uh, Columbus going, and what happened was, and this is documented in this is documented very well. So Columbus is going, and they're sailing along, and they're trying to find you know India, but they find the Americas. And he says the first person who sights land. Imagine you're traveling for such a long time, you don't know if you're going to make it. The first person to sight land, you're going to get a bonus reward of this many gold coins and whatever it is, right? So what happens is. Rodrigo de Triana is the first guy to actually sight the land and he sees from far distance, he's looking, checking out, he's, I want to be the first one and we need to find it. You got, someone's got to keep looking. He looks and he finds the land first. What does Columbus do? Columbus says, oh, oh, that land? I saw that last night, you know, I just didn't want to say anything. So he basically said, no, no, I'm going to get the reward because I actually saw it the night before, but I just didn't say it but I saw it before you. So he basically deprived this guy of his, you know, uh, of his reward that he should have gotten. So what's interesting about this guy is this guy uh, is on Columbus's ship. He arrives with Columbus into the Americas. We don't know exactly what happened to him, what he saw and his records and everything. But when he returns back to Spain, what does he decide to do? He goes to Africa and he converts to Islam. What did he see on that island and what did he witness? We can, we, we can only speculate, right? So this guy comes, who's on Columbus's ship, he goes and he accepts Islam. This is really interesting. Then there's three brothers known as the Pinzon brothers. 
these three Pinzon brothers, one of two of them are navigating the ships of Columbus. I think it was the Nina and the Pinta. And there was a third one who was the second in command on board of one of these ships. Now these people, we don't know if they were Muslim or they're what's called Moriscos or not, but we know for a fact that they're somehow related to Abu Zayyan Muhammad III, who was a Sultan in area of Northern Africa, Morocco, Maghrib area. So they have a Muslim relationship of a background somehow, and they potentially could have been Muslims. Now you have to understand why could they have been Muslims? You know, why, why would they be Muslim, but they're not declaring that they're Muslim? So what happened was, in Spain, once the cities of Spain were taken over, there was something known as the Inquisition that began. And the Inquisition was primarily against Jews and then extended to Muslims. It's basically, you need to convert to Christianity or we'll kick you out or we'll kill you. Basically, we'll burn you or we'll torture you, whatever it is. You, you must convert to Christianity. So Muslims are being forced to convert to Christianity whether they like it or not. So what happens now is that there's a fatwa. Fatwa is like a religious ruling coming from the Muslim muftis in the Moroccan region. Okay? So these muftis issue a fatwa and they say, look, we understand how difficult it is for you Spanish Muslims that now that you've lost all of the cities, but you're still living there. Thousands of Muslims are still living there. And we know what's going on. Because of this, the fatwa was, and one Sharisi, one Sharisi is one of those people, and you could read his fatwa, and all of these fatwas have been preserved. If they force you to convert to Christianity, you can just pretend that you've converted. And they list out the details. So if they try to baptize you, go ahead and get baptized, but keep reciting the La ilaha illallah while you're being baptized. If they force you to eat pork, you can eat the pork as long as in your heart you're hating this and you're having a distaste and a hatred for it. If they force you to drink wine, you can do this because this is exactly what happened. They would force them to be baptized. They would force them to eat pork. They would force them to drink wine. And this is, it, it got so bad in Spain around this time that what happened was any place where you were, so what happens is anyway, what happens is if you're forced to become Christian and you're a Christian now, but you have a background of being Muslim, you're not a Moor anymore. Moor means Muslim. So now you're called a Morisco. And Morisco means a little more, right? So it's, it's, it's a diminutive form. It's, it's a way of, it's a type of insult. So what Morisco basically means is you are saying you're a Christian. We don't know if we believe you. And they probably shouldn't believe them because they were forced to convert anyways. But it got so bad that they were so scared of anyone practicing even the smallest amount of Islam that on Friday, they used to make sure anyone who's a Morisco, who has a background of a Muslim background, your house, doors, and windows have to be open the whole day on Friday. Just in case somehow we see you standing against the wall and it, you're trying to somehow pray in your mind. We want to make sure that you are not practicing anything in Islam. It was so bad that the Muslims initially what they would do is they would stand against the wall and they would just be looking as if they're looking at the wall and they would be doing their salah. They would be praying. They can't do a motion. They can't do a movement because the moment they make a move, someone will report them to the Inquisition Council. They'll be tortured. And they'll be killed. So that's how bad it got. You know? And I was, I've traveled to Spain many times. Inshallah, we'll do another trip. There are people today who say, our grandparents, these are not Muslims. These are Christians. They just say, our grandparents, we remember some rituals five times a day, for some reason, they would go and they would walk up to a wall and they would stand in front of that wall and they would say something. And we don't know what they're saying. I was a little kid. I remember my grandparents. And they would just do this. And they're doing this five times a day and it just doesn't make any sense to me. You know? And then my grandma or grandpa passed away and we never really understood what they're doing. But this is what we remember. And they're doing it exactly at the prayer times. They would wake up, we don't understand, why would they wake up before sunrise to go and stand at a wall and do this? It's because we're talking about 400 years later, people were preserving their Islam, even though Islam has been completely outlawed 
for the last four, you know, 400, over 400 years in Spain. So this is what a Morisco is anyways. So these Pinzon brothers actually come from a Muslim background where they have a relatives as being Muslims. They potentially, it's said that they could have been uh, Moriscos who are actually sham conversion to Christianity. Allah knows best, you know, we won't uh, dwell on that too much. There's another guy named Nuflo de Olano. He was an African Muslim who was with Vasco Nunez de Balboa, who actually visited Central America or quote unquote discovered, you know, Central America. The Muslim was on that ship. He arrived there, he was in the Americas. One of the most famous people that we know is Estebanico. Estebanico of Azamor. Okay, so Estebanico sounds like a really nice Spanish name. What it means is, Esteban is, the name for Stephen, right? Estebanico is the little Stephen, right? So this is little Stephen. Little Stephen's real name is Mustafa uh, Zemuri. Mustafa Zemuri is born in Morocco in the city of Azamor. Azamor is defeated by the Portuguese. They conquer the city. They capture him as a slave. He goes on an expedition in 1527 and he reaches Hispaniola. Okay, Hispaniola is which two countries today? Anybody? Trick question. Well, it's not a trick question. Dominican Republic and? Haiti. Haiti. Awesome. Good. So that's Hispaniola. Okay. So he arrived there, Dominican Republic and Haiti. He gets there in 1527, which is not too far from Florida. So now they're making their way to Florida in 1527. A hurricane comes, destroys most of their ship. Most of the crew is dead. Four people survive. Mustafa, or Estebanico, I'll call him Mustafa from now on. It's nice. All right. Mustafa comes along and he takes over and he leads the rest of the group. They travel from Florida all the way across the western United States down to Mexico City, 5,000 mile journey, pretty much on foot. Okay. It takes them from 1527 to 1536, they arrive in Mexico City. They're moving along very slowly, but they're basically going and they're discovering the rest of America over here, so discovering quote unquote, right? So he's there. He's known as the person who discovered New Mexico. Okay, so if you're in New Mexico and you knew something about that state and you cared about that state somehow, then you would actually know his nickname, he's known as Tebanico, is the discoverer of New Mexico, quote unquote. So what happened is there's a scholar by the name of Juan Francisco Maura. They, you know, they have theories of what happened to this guy. So basically, he went down into Mexico City, he joined the rest of the Spanish, but he's still a slave. He led the expedition, he led the other three people, but because he's a background, he's Muslim, he's still a slave, right? Because he's from Africa, he's from that part of the region. So he goes down, and then somehow he goes up, and they say, you know what, he just disappeared. We don't know exactly what happened to him, but we think he was killed by this native tribe. Now that's one theory, right? And they say he's dead. One Francisco Maura, he's a scholar, in 2002 he wrote, he said that the Zunis, the tribe, they did not kill Estevanico. What actually happened was him and his friends, they faked his death and he actually could get freedom from slavery because he was just sick and tired. He said, after all of this that he's done, they're going to keep him in slavery? He said, forget that. So he actually went and he joined the tribe and from there, we don't know the rest of his story. Maybe he preached Islam, intermarried with them. We have no idea what happened because the documents don't exist. But we can just imagine what happened. So a very interesting guy. Estevanico is very well known. He's celebrated. There's statues of him, all that stuff, right? So he's there as well, pre-independence. Uh, then we got the settlement in Jamestown. Okay, I'm going to have to speed up now because we get 9.30. So settlements in Jamestown, they were Turkish Muslims living in America pre-independence as well. So what's happening is, Ottoman Empire is very strong still at this time. It's one of the world powers. It co conquered Constantinople, which is now Istanbul. So you have silk and textile workers coming into Cuba, coming into Florida in the 16th century, 1500s. This is all documented. So you have these workers coming in, and there were many Turks coming in from the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire, Turks, doesn't mean they're necessarily Turkish in origin. Anyone who's a subject of the Ottoman Empire they're going to be coming in, and almost all of them are Muslims. So what happened was, in 1631, the colony in Jamestown, Jamestown is the first 
uh, English colony in the Americas. They're very famous. You've probably heard of Jamestown. You probably studied it in American history, and then you forgot it, you know, the week after your exam. But you probably remember the name, right? So Jamestown is the first English colony in America. In 1631, they passed a law, and they said there are no more Turks going to be coming into Jamestown. No more Turks and no more infidels. Okay, infidels are the Muslims. We don't want infidels and we don't want Turks. Why don't we want Turks? Because there's so many Turks here. And they have a problem. They're like, why are there so many Muslims in Jamestown coming in? That's it. We got to put a stop to it. So they made this document, passed a resolution. No more Turks coming into Jamestown. What does that mean? That means there's a lot of Turks living in Jamestown. And they're all Muslim. It's 1631. So they're living there. They're doing stuff. Something's happening. You have documents of their names. Mehmed the Turk. Right? Very common Turkish name. It looks like they haven't changed in 400 years. It's still Mehmed, <laughs> Mehmed Muhammad. All right, Mehmed the Turk, Ahmed the Turk, Sayyan Turk. All of these names are documented in registers, which you can find in libraries. There are uh, two documents from 1652 documenting the type of Turks in that region as well. A lot more research exists in that as well. So that is pre-independence. 1776, America gets its independence and we have some other people coming along. So, in before we move on to this guy, all right, you don't have to stare at him. 1790, 1790, you have Moroccans coming into America. Okay, these were people who were forced as slaves in the beginning, and what happened was they were working, they were doing good, they come from educated backgrounds, so they petitioned the Congress, they petitioned the President of the United States, and they said 1790. And they said, you know, we're tired of being treated this way. You know, we're in, we are indentured servants. We came here to work, and you're treating us, you know, bad, and we don't like this treatment. So what did they do? The president passed an act. It's known as the Moore Sundry Act by President John Adams. And in that document, he says, there should be no enmity against any Musliman. Right? And then he continues the document and goes on. So what is that? They're mentioning that there are Muslims here, they're being petitioned by the President of the United States. He says, there's nothing wrong with Muslims. 1790s, right? So this is important. And then we don't know exactly what happened to this group and what they did. The documents have not been preserved. Next guy that comes along, Ayuba Suleiman Diallo. Okay, Ayub Suleiman Diallo. He was captured in Gambia in the year 1731. He was shipped in uh, as a slave into the Americas. He earned his freedom because he was a very highly educated person. He was so educated, he met King George III, uh, King George II. He wrote three Qur'ans from memory over there in the Americas. There was a painting of him. This is the painting that they made. When they came back to Europe, they decided they're going to paint him. While they were painting him, they said, we, we want to draw you in your native dress, not in your American clothing, because he's wearing American clothing. We want to know what, it, what your native dress is like. Can you somehow, you know, go and get your native dress and, you know, you can wear that? And he says, you know, no, you don't, you don't need me to wear it, right? I'm going to describe to you exactly what my dress looks like and your expert painters will paint it perfectly. They'll do it exactly. And he said, that's not possible. We, we can't draw from a description. And then what did he say? He was trying to prove a point. He says, you guys, Christians, you draw... God, in a picture, who you've never seen in your life. You've seen me, and I'm describing my clothes. I can describe to you what my clothing is, and you're saying you can't draw from a description. You've never seen God. You've never had God describe to you what he looks like, and you still draw him in your pictures. This guy is not afraid. This guy is not looking up to white Europeans saying, oh man, i got to be careful, i got to be quiet. This is a person who has self-confidence, he has dignity, and these people are role models for us. When we, when we study their history, they're amazing role models. We should really read. There's so much to read. There's so many biographies out there. We're just going to speed through it real quick, though. One day we'll have a seminar on it. This is Abdurrahman Ibrahim Ibn Sori. Okay? He was born in 1762. He died in 1829. What's interesting about this guy, other than the fact that he looks really cool in that coat, is that he was a prince from Guinea. He's a Fulani. Fulani is a type of tribe. He's a Fulani prince from Guinea. He is captured in the year 1788, and he's shipped to Mississippi. And he's highly educated. I mean, if you're a prince, princely family coming from this region, highly educated community. 
So he knew four African languages, he knew Arabic, he knew English. And he got captured somehow. I mean, he studied in Timbuktu. I mentioned Timbuktu, the madrasas, the Islamic universities there. So he studied in Timbuktu, very well-versed, very well-learned person. So he goes, ends up in Mississippi somehow. While he's in Mississippi, he is a slave. So somehow along the way, he met somebody he knew, visited Africa, Dr. John Cox. Dr. John Cox was an Irish surgeon who actually had visited him and he was one of the people who helped him learn English. So he goes and he says, what are you doing here in America? You're the prince of the country over there. What are you doing here? He says, I was captured as a slave and they brought me over here. So he goes to his, his owner, Thomas Foster. It's funny because he owned a farm. So like Foster Farms, you know? So anyways, so he, he owns a farm and he goes, okay. He started referring to him as Prince. He nicknamed him Prince. He goes, hey Prince, go do this, go do that. But you know what? Mr. Foster would not let him go. And the guy, Dr. Cox was saying, you need to let this, this is a prince, you can't keep him in slavery. Dr. You know, Thomas Foster didn't like it. He spent 38 years working on a cotton plantation. 38 years. And then finally in 1826, he wrote back to his relatives a letter saying, you know, I need to get out of here. You know, he figured out a way, somehow he knew his relatives, he sent a letter. And this is really interesting. So he, while he's sending the letter, one of the local reporters in that area, they got a hold of the letter somehow. They said, whoa, this guy's a prince and he's living over here in Mississippi. So he goes and he hands it to the senator of Mississippi. Senator of Mississippi looks at it and goes, what the heck, what is this? Goes and sends it to like the State Department of America. State Department goes and says, whoa, okay, we need to send this to the US Embassy in you know, M Morocco because they thought he was Moroccan. We need to go send this to the U.S. Embassy in Morocco and figure out what's going to happen. So they go and they send it to the U.S. Consulate in Morocco. They just assume, they assume that he was a Moor. A Moor meaning like from that region because he wrote his letter in Arabic. And they think, oh, these people don't write Arabic because for them, they're like, oh, they're African. They only know their Fulani language or their Mandinkan language. If you studied in Timbuktu University, you know Arabic. You're a scholar. You know the Quran. They have the Quran memorized. They have hadith memorized. They have all of these things going on for them, right? So what happens now is after the consulate of Morocco, they said, you're not going to keep this prince. doesn't matter if he's from Morocco or not. This is a prince guy coming from Africa. You need to release him. They sent a letter to the president of the United States. In, in 1828, U.S. President John Quincy Adams and the Secretary of State Henry Clay, they decide that we're going to release him. They go to Mr. Foster. They're like, Mr. Foster, you need to let this guy go. Then Mr. Foster, not a very nice guy. Outside of the fact that he calls him Prince, he's not a very nice guy. So he says, okay, the only, um, this is the President of the United States telling you, this guy needs to let be let go and he needs to leave. Maybe because he was so good at what he did, he controlled the whole plantation, right? He was a very educated guy. He was very good at what he did. So he says, one condition, I will release him on one condition. And that is, I mean, obviously he's gonna get money from the government and everything. He says, he's not allowed to live in America as a freed slave. He needs to go back to his country. I don't want him in America. This guy's like, you know, really got a problem. So that was his condition. So they said, okay, fine. We're gonna free him, we're gonna send him back. Before he leaves the US, what does Abdurrahman do? He goes to visit Washington DC. He meets President Adams in person, talks to him, and he starts raising funds. He does a fundraiser in Washington, D.C. And he says, I want to raise funds to liberate my family, my wife and my kids, because I want them to come back with me and Mr. Foster is not letting them go. So he raises some money from the people there, liberates his wife, didn't get to liberate all of his sons, and he moved back to uh, Liberia at the time. So there's a drawing of him in the Library of Congress and there's a good book about him. It's called Prince Among Slaves. And they made a movie out of it as well. And the narrator of the movie is Most Def, Yasin Bey. If you guys heard of the rapper Most Def, he is um, the one who's narrating in the background. Very interesting story about him. Next guy is Nicholas Said, right? That's an interesting name, but that's not his real name, right? So this guy is Muhammad Ali ibn Sa'id. Okay, Muhammad ibn Ali Sa'id was uh, sold to a Russian. He was enslaved, sold to a Russian, traveled around a bunch of different countries in Europe, all over the place. 
Then he was freed. He's emancipated. He's not a slave anymore. Then he decides to move to America. In 1862, he is in the city of Detroit. He becomes a school teacher. When there's, what happened in the 1860s in America? Very important, significant event. Civil War. So what does he do? He joins the Union Army. When he joins the Union Army, he is a private. Within two months, he's so good as a soldier, he becomes a sergeant within two months. So there's his entire biography was published in 1867 by the newspaper or the periodical, the Atlantic Monthly, which was like the most prominent periodical at the time. So his detailed biography is there, his autobiography is there, Atlantic Monthly has his old article as well. You could read about his life as well, it's pretty interesting. There's another guy by the name of Bilali Muhammad. I don't have a good picture of him. I don't think, no, I don't got a good picture of him. So Bilali Muhammad was uh, another West African who was enslaved. In 1802, he ends up in Georgia. He's from an educated family. He's a very educated man. He's owned by someone named Thomas Spaulding. Thomas Spaulding is not like Mr. Foster. He's actually a really nice guy. So what he does is he puts, he realizes Bilali, Bilali Muhammad, is so intelligent, he's so quick, he's so sharp, that he goes and puts him as the manager of the entire plantation, overseeing 500 other workers. So he's the head of the plantation, he doesn't need any oversight. This guy is very smart, very educated. So his owner goes, Mr. Thomas Spaulding, he goes and he finds a copy of the Quran. He knows Bilali is a Muslim. He finds a copy of the Quran, he buys a copy of the Quran and gives it to Bilali. So he gives him a copy of the Quran, and then Bilali goes, you know, can we build a masjid? Because there's more Muslims among the slaves here. He goes, yeah, we're going to let you build a masjid. So Bilali Muhammad built the first masjid in America that we know of before the year 1812. And I'll tell you why, how we know it's before 1812. So what happens is, an important event happens in 1812. What is that? The War of 1812. So the British come along and they're going to try to fight America, right? And... Uh, they go and they tempt the slaves. And they say, you know what, any slave who rebels, you know, we're encouraging you to rebel and stand up and join the you know, British Empire and we'll grant, guarantee your freedom, we're about to take over America. Now that's a very tempting offer, right? It's like someone is gonna free you, give you your complete freedom. But Bilali Muhammad was, he respected this man, even though he's a slave, he's not really being treated like a slave. So he goes, he respects this man so much, he says, don't worry. We're going to protect your plantation. We're going to handle everything. And he said, look, this is what I can do for you. There's 500 slaves here. We will stay here and fight. If you need to leave, that's fine. We will fight the British while we're here in the War of 1812. I can guarantee you that every single Muslim here, they're not going to join the British. They're going to stand here. They're going to protect your land. And we're going to fight till the death. But for the non-Muslim slaves, I can't guarantee anything because I don't have any control over them. Which means what? Which means that they're a community. There's a Muslim community, there's a masjid, he actually has a leadership, he's like the leader of the Muslims over there. So he goes and they actually fight. Now what does this guy do, Thomas Spaulding? He goes and gets 80 muskets, 80 rifles, 80 guns, and he arms all of the Muslim slaves here. I mean, this doesn't happen normally, right? You know, you don't arm your slaves. Right? And this is probably the only time in history where they arm the slaves. So they arm them, and he goes and they fight. In, 18, in 1812, they fight and, they, and they're successful and obviously America you know, did not get taken over by the British. What's interesting afterwards is Bilali Muhammad dies in the year 1857, much later. They found a document in his, in his house. It's 13 pages and it's in Arabic. So they figured, oh, this is the diary of Bilali Muhammad. He probably wrote how he was feeling, what he's doing in America and all that. And then finally, Cent or decades later, someone comes along and they looked at it and they said, wait a minute, this is not an autobiography. This has nothing to do with him. It's actually a work of fiqh. It's a book on Islamic law. It starts out with Islamic beliefs. Then it talks about tahara, how you make wudu and how you make tayammum and all that. Then it goes to salah, it goes to the adhan, it goes through everything. And then when they compared it with another book, which is known as the Risala of Imam Abi Zayd al-Qirawani, which is a Maliki fiqh book, which is taught throughout North, you know, North Africa. I mean, I studied in France. It was part of our curriculum as well. This is a book which many people, they're taught, and they memorize word for word. He had this book memorized, but when they compared it, they realized this is not an, an exact 
duplicate. He didn't duplicate the book. He modified the book for his own circumstances, which means what? It means that Bilali Muhammad wrote the first original work of Islam in America at that time in around 1820, 1830, whatever it may be. So this is really interesting, the first Islamic literature that's been produced in America. All right? Then we got a few other people. We got this guy. Okay? This is, his name is Hai Jolly, if you can see. All right? That's a pretty funny name, right? Hai Jolly, how are you doing? Right? So Hai Jolly is actually Hajj Ali. Because he performed Hajj, so he's known as Haji <laughs> Ali. But the Americans, they're like, Hajj, Hajj, Hajj Ali? Haj, Ali, ha, we'll call you High Jolly, all right? That sounds good. That's, that's going to be better. So his, na his name becomes High Jolly, all right? This was a guy who basically came into America. He was recruited from the Ottoman Empire, and he became the head of the U.S. Army Camel Corps in the year 1856. So the president of America decided, you know what? There's so much desert in America, especially in the West, like where we are. We need a way to transport things on a much cheaper scale and a quick scale. And we need some camels to go to the desert. You know, people make fun of camels and all that. U.S. had a camel corps, right? Camel corps, part of the U.S. army led by a Muslim from the Ottoman Empire, all right? So people should just be quiet, right? So camel corps coming along, and he is in charge of this, 1856. He led this in the Southwest. He became a citizen in the year 1880 because he decided to stay. And then he was hired again by the U.S. Army in 1885. He died in the year 1902 in Arizona. And in the site of Quartzsite, Arizona, they decided 30 years later, that we love this guy so much, he's so interesting, he's such an important figure, that they made a monument. So they made a little pyramid. You know, even in Islam, you're not supposed to make all these monuments and stuff on graves, but anyways, they did it. They made this monument and they put a camel on top. So this is the most visited, visited site in Quartzsite, Arizona. I'm sure there's not much in Quartzsite, Arizona. Anyways, but, so this is a place, if you ever traveled through Quartzsite, Arizona, you can see Haji Ali, Hai Jali. You can't even tell he's Muslim if you see Hai Jali, but it's Haji Ali, he was there, okay? So then you got, the, if you think about it, 20 million enslaved Africans came and they were shipped to America. It's estimated that between 20 to 30% of these people were Muslims. And what's interesting is, many of the Muslims who were enslaved, they were highly educated. In fact, they may have been more educated than the American Southerners who were, you know, these tobacco plantations and sugar plantations. Many of these were so illiterate they couldn't even read or write. The only difference is, they're reading and writing in Arabic and in their native language, whereas, you know, the Americans who are there in the plantations and all that, they have a different language. But they're probably more knowledgeable than the other ones. And what we have is we have a bunch of what they consider to be scribblings and documents left. No one could read these things. So they got destroyed. They're like, oh, what is this? Some slave is writing some document. What, who, what does he think he's doing writing? So they just destroy it. So we've lost a lot of that, unfortunately. But there is a So, so what we have here is a bunch of slaves coming. These slaves are writing, but much of this history is lost because of the reasons which we mentioned. All right. Now we got the modern period, super summarized version of the modern period here. In 1893, you got Alexander Russell Webb. He established the American Muslim Brotherhood, not to be confused with the Muslim Brotherhood today. Okay. So he established the American Muslim Brotherhood. He was giving lectures. He was an ambassador to the United Nations on behalf of Islam. He, attend, he gave a lecture on Islam. Mark Twain, the famous author, was in attendance of that lecture. So if somebody said, oh, well, Mark Twain didn't know about Islam. No, he knew exactly about Islam. Right? So you got him, very important figure, an amazing book written by Dr. Amr Farooq Abdullah about his life. I recommend you check it out. Then you got this guy. This is Wallace D. Farb. Okay, This is the guy who is basically responsible for the founding of the Nation of Islam. Nation of Islam, Islam is a very powerful uh, movement, or it was a very powerful movement, which produced someone who we really know well, is Malcolm X. No, may Allah be pleased with him. So this is uh, Wallace D. Fard. What happened was he met Elijah Muhammad, who became his student, and then somehow Wallace D. Fard 
disappeared and went back to another country. Elijah Muhammad comes along, establishes the nation of Islam, becomes a very powerful force for many African Americans or many black Americans to come into Islam, even though it's a distorted form of Islam. His son, when he passes away, his son is supposed to take over, and his son comes along, Warith Din Muhammad, and he says, my father was wrong. He was not correct. This is not true Islam. We need to join true Islam. So among his followers, 500,000 people accepted Islam in one shot under his son, and they came into, from the nation of Islam, they came into Islam. Many people traced their origins back, including Malcolm X and many, many other figures. So he's an important figure in history, okay? Before we conclude, there's a bunch of other things, you know, short of time. Inshallah, one day, should we do like a seminar on this, like a day seminar? We should do a day seminar, okay. So, it, yeah, inshallah? Inshallah ta'ala. So there's a lot of information, there's a lot of good books, so I'll recommend more, but it's, it's important to know how Islam developed. But the last thing I'll mention here is, um, in 19, 1924, there was a law that was passed called the National Origins Act, or it's called the Asian Exclusion Act. And what happened was, is in 1924, the Americans said, we don't want all these Asians. And when they say Asians, they meant Far East Asians, Japanese, Chinese workers, and all that. So we don't want these people in our country. So they made this National Origins Act, which stopped immigration from everyone particularly Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, all those people. But then down in the list somewhere, they were all the people from the Middle East and the Muslims and all the other countries that you have Muslims from. So there's no migration of Muslims coming in because they're not allowed to from 1924. In 1965, the National Origins Act was repealed. And now that it's repealed, the borders are open. And that's why the vast majority of Muslims, the new generation of Muslims, they all started migrating after 1965 because Immigration was not open unless you're coming in as like a PhD student or you're coming in as a doctor or, or something very, very highly skilled level worker or for some other reason, right? So this new wave of immigration came along. Muslims in America founded the Federation of Islamic Association in America and Canada in the 50s, the Muslim Student Association in the 60s. In 1982, they founded the Islamic Society of North America and then you have all the other organizations coming later. Islamic Circle of North America, Muslim Students, uh, what is it, Mass Muslim American Society, and all the organizations that are built. So the conclusion of all of this is this, is that Muslims, first of all, are not Johnny-come-latelys. We've been in America before Columbus was here, while Columbus was here, before independence, after independence, we've been part and parcel of the entire American history in some capacity. There has been a major contribution from Muslims, even though they've been suppressed. So Islam was here. But what I want you to take home is, I want you to look at the people who lived through the slavery, through the circumstances, through everything, all of the situation that they lived through, what, what kind of resources did they have? What kind of money did they have to try to preserve Islam in America with the little amount that they had they actually achieved a lot if you look at it in detail in history. Look at the resources that we have. We got people from all different walks of life. They're making good salaries. They're going to good universities. They have marble kitchens. They have, you know, cable TV or Netflix or whatever it is. They got, you know, smartphone. We got so much resources today. We have so many privileges that people of the past did not have. If we can't do significantly larger effort than these people did and we complain about the Islamophobia that we're going through and we say it's too difficult and we got Donald Trump now as our president and we got you know we got some random ISIS group every time keeps coming on the TV the patience that these Muslims had to go through we can't even imagine read their biographies read their autobiographies read what they went through and read how they maintained their Islam throughout all of this and that's an, amazing left, uh, you know, that's an amazing lesson for us. And we need to make sure, we have to look at what we have, we need to make sure that our kids grow up to be proud Muslims in America without any inferiority complex whatsoever. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to establish Islam in this land and have strong Muslim families in this land. Last thing is we have a table from California Islamic University outside um, where we have some books and we have some classes coming up. Inshallah, I'll finish since I did so much research anyways. We'll do a seminar soon from California Islamic University on this topic.
probably six hour seminar or something like that. So look forward to that, inshallah.